Oh. Go ahead and start. I got it. Hello and welcome to Demo Tuesday. You'll notice the distinct absence of a sizzle reel this week, uh, but we've decided that when you bring along a uh, black badger like Pete Suba, Shuba to this event, you basically have sizzle enough for anybody. So uh, as always, I am Pete Hay and I'm your host today. This is Pete Shoba. He's a uh, red teamer on the uh, on the SimSpace red team. And um, as he's known colloquially, I call him Other Pete. Uh, but uh, we figured that for today, since the name Adventures of Pete and Pete was already taken, we'd tell you a little bit about the anatomy of what it is that makes a black badger. So uh, Pete, let me turn it over to you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So hi, I'm Pete. I like to go by uh, Pete Superior, uh, especially in the company of Pete Hay, but that's a discussion for another time. Um, yeah, so I'm a former Navy. Um, I joined the Navy uh, out of college, uh, did a whole bunch of really cool stuff with some three-letter agencies, got to work on the front lines of like the cyber defensive world and then the cyber offensive world, did some dev work, did some IT infrastructure work, um, loved that, ended up um, uh, taking the uniform off. Uh, I worked for the Navy, but as a government civilian for a few years. Um, and after that, I uh, heard about SimSpace, got to work with the platform a little bit while I was still in and uh, decided time to jump ship and here we are. Um, and I tell you what, it's been a great move. So uh, here's hoping it keeps up. So this ship jumping, literal or figurative? Literal in a way, but we'll, we'll call it figurative. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. There was actual um, physical jumping off of a ship at one point, yes. Yeah. All right, there you go, excellent. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your adventures at uh, Black Hat this year. Um, sure. But I really want to talk about this badge challenge. So uh, first question I've got for you is, can you just, for those of us who may not be familiar with the badge challenge, what, what is it in broad strokes? Sure. Um, so every year at DEF CON, um, your badge is itself a puzzle. So the badge is the thing that you have to wear around your neck to get into the conference. There's people at every door checking to make sure that you got it so people can't sneak in, right? Um, they alternate years where every odd year it's it's like a paper thing or a, a physical medium, and then every even year it's electronic. Um, so this year's badge was um, this, here, I actually got it over here, was this thing, right? So this is a fully working uh, MIDI sampling keyboard. Um, meaning you can like turn it on and you can hit the play button and you hit these buttons. Yeah, it works. And you can record samples and you can make it play back and you can, you know, make yourself sound very strange. Um, very cool thing. It, it's just a neat toy, right? Um, but baked into it, uh, there are puzzles to be solved. And that's, it's the same every year. Uh, where the challenge is is usually different. Uh, every year's challenge looks very different from the last year's. So you got to kind of find the challenge. You'll kind of find a, a thread to start pulling at, and you pull at it, and it leads to more and more challenges until eventually there is an end game. Um, and it's usually pretty stiff competition, right? You know, there's there's twenty five thousand of these things on average floating around out there. So there's a lot of people looking at it, playing with it, finding the challenge, and then hopefully solving them. So what, um, well, first of all, is it something you do by yourself or as a group or some combination of the above? A uh, combination. So it's an individual challenge. It's always an individual challenge, but um, the only way that you have a chance of winning it is to do it in a group. Um, crowdsourcing is an absolute must. This year was uh, especially uh, a must. It, it was such a difficult challenge that even crowdsourcing it to the entire con, basically, um, we almost didn't finish it before the conference ended. Um, some of them, some of the challenges were just really tough. Um, okay. But there are, in past years, there have been teams, you know, nine or 10 people that will go and that'll make it their mission to just do the badge challenge. And they, if they win, they pick one person to, to be the winner. Um, because unfortunately, yeah, it's an individual challenge at the end of the day. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so tell me about um, how do you start this? Like what 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 kind of uh, what kind of steps are involved in in solving a challenge like this? So this year it was pretty straightforward. Um, in previous years it's kind of been hidden somewhere on the badge. This year there's like a menu option on the thing that says challenge, and so you scroll to the challenge option, you click it, and it gives you your first one. Um, so um, it, it, 
if you go to my uh, my write up, um, you can see what it said for the first part of this challenge was collect the measures, break the silence, continue the journey. A little bit cryptic, um, but when it says collect the measures, break the silence, uh, you know, and there's a musical measure on the face of the badge, uh, we kind of knew right away what we were trying to do. Um, it's it's a very common challenge requirement to gather information from all of the different badge types at DEF CON. There are um, nine major ones, not including the black badge, um, just depending on, you know, if you're a vendor, if you work there, or if you're an attendee or whatever. Um, so anyway, this year, that was step one, was find all the different badge types and get information from the physical badges themselves. So the crowdsourcing is really important for that sort of thing. Well, yeah, even if you're doing it alone, you're going to have to run around and find a bunch of people wearing these badges. Um, and it's also common, like the lanyard, sometimes the lanyard that the badge is attached to will have a, a piece of the puzzle baked in. This year it did not, but uh, another very common thing. All right. So then uh, from then, where'd you go from there? So um, it was actually interesting. We, we, uh, they start handing out the badges the day before DEF CON starts. Um, so we had these things in our hands before the conference floor was open, before we knew what the heck was going on. And before... <laughs> Before the challenge had even officially started, um, we had pictures of eight of the nine badge types. We had a really hard time finding one of them. Um, we had kind of brute forced the solution with an incomplete puzzle because we just had so many eyes on it. They figured out pretty quickly what the song was that we were trying to put together. Um, and then just from playing with it, we had unlocked stage two without realizing that it was stage two because, again, the contest hadn't started yet. Um, okay. We also, uh, this is this is crazy but um if you've read through the uh the the write-up um there, there's kind of three major steps and three major sections of the challenge to get through um the third stage uh is once you had found all of your friends you had called them and uh, gotten your final unlock codes um somebody figured out how to dump the badge firmware uh found the part of the firmware the code that you were supposed to input that unlock to uh, reverse engineered it uh, found the unlock generation algorithm, made that for their own badge, and had unlocked step three before we had even started the challenge. Um, the way that this year's challenge worked, that didn't really help anyone because you needed the URL associated with the challenge to submit that answer. But we basically had one of the final answers before the game even started and just didn't know it. It's always funny how that happens, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it, it was just... You know, the, the write-up is nice and linear, but the reality of how that went down, it, it, it's anything but. Well, so let's let's walk through it um, as linearly yeah. as we can. Um, so what was that? So after you get through that initial mapping out the badges, mm -hmm. unlocking the that initial challenge mode, where'd you go right. from there? So yeah, uh, you play that song on your badge and it tells you basically to call Jenny, except the word Jenny is spelled backwards and the letters are all mirrored. Um, so, I mean, and, and this is true for almost all of the challenges this year. It's just one sort of vague cryptic statement. And then you have to figure out the answer to that riddle uh, by submitting it as a URL on defcon.org. So um, we pretty quickly discovered that um, we're no longer working on the physical badge itself um, because, again, we had dumped and analyzed the firmware of the thing. So we knew that there was no more, you know, weird functions or weird code in there that we hadn't accessed yet. Um, so there had to be something else. Well, in the conference itself uh, was a, a giant ring of tables with a big cardboard sign that said, you know, badge challenge. Like, OK, well, this is obviously where we're supposed to be. There was a bunch of black telephones on it. Um, and I mean, that's it. So we've got the phrase call Jenny and then a table in the middle of the conference with black telephones. Like, OK, cool. Um, pretty quickly figured out so that next year we're was... showing up. Sorry, next year we're going to show up with a table and a cardboard sign that says badge challenge and throw a bunch of random things on top of it and see what kind that of madness be, ensues. That would be an epic troll. And it would absolutely work after this year. Because I tell you, that's, uh, that's not super common. They're usually all contained on the badge, but this year, not at all. Um, most of the challenges were not on the badge this year. So um, yeah, that would be hilarious. Uh, but I'm not sure know, that's how I want to get the time. history. <laughs> you would, yeah, you would absolutely sow chaos. But anyway, so yeah, uh, call Jenny. So right, who was the, Jenny? The That's the question. Who was Jenny? The name of the song, Jenny, you know, 8675309. Uh, and then you just call go. it backwards because the name Jenny is backwards. So you called that on those phones in the conference center. 
Um, and it is a pretty neat setup where, you know, it's a ring of black phones, but then they all have cables going to this big black, you know, Pelican case in the middle. And so you could tell that there was some cool custom like phone relay hardware in there. Um, but anyway, it, it would give you a robotic voice and the robotic voice would tell you, okay, you need to find these five friends and it would tell you one riddle per friend. So we went from Jenny to now five riddles, one per friend uh, for uh, A, B, C, D, and E. They each started with, you know, those letters. So it was Alice, Bob, Carol, Dan, and Eve. Um, and again, it, it we could go through those in order if you care, but again, it, it didn't go down like that. We, we, we solved Alice almost immediately. Bob, we almost didn't solve. Uh, Carol, uh, they, they all were kind of at the same time and, and it got kind of confusing because there was a, uh, so many people working on it and there was at least two major discords where people were working on it. So the information trying to keep it all straight got a little bit crazy. Um, but we, we got through them all uh, by about the end of day one. So at the end of day one, we had found the five friends and then there was a, um, there was a bonus, like an Easter egg uh, for Trevor the Roach. Um, if, if you've, uh, if you're familiar with Grifter and, and his experience with uh, a, a cockroach named Trevor, uh, absolutely hilarious story, uh, worth Googling. There's a, a video in the write-up, and I highly encourage you to look at that if you haven't. Um, but there was like a, 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 an LED, one LED on the badge face that was blinking in Morse code. And if you took that Morse code, it said Trevor's date, and, and it was the date of the Trevor incident. Uh, you could find Trevor the cockroach in there, too. So there was actually six friends. Um Interestingly, though, um, Dan, oh no, excuse me, uh, Bob, the second friend, um, we had so much trouble finding him that at the end of the first day, uh, the, the, the creator of all these badges was frequenting the table of phones. So he was just kind of like monitoring our progress and making sure that, you know, it was running smoothly. Um, he got so frustrated with our inability to find Bob that at one point he tweeted out a hint for us. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the people who are all working on the badge challenge, we all follow that guy on Twitter. Once we once we learned that it was him who made them all, because I didn't know going in, a lot of us didn't. Um, but once we knew it was him, we follow him on Twitter and he tweets out this thing. And it's like, oh, hey, that has, you know, vague uh, familiarity. What, what's he talking about? It was it was the geocache challenge. So we could not we could not figure out what the heck to do with the geocache challenge. Um, but anyway, yeah, we found that we got through it. Uh, good times. Um, let me see here. If there's any that you'd like to talk about, we can do that. Otherwise, no, um, no I think that's good because I think if anyone has interest in what that looks like, uh, they can, you know, they can go to your blog and take a look at it. So let's let's okay. pivot a little bit. Let's talk about because you were just talking about the challenge and how mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, a vague hint, and then you're kind of drilling down into it. Um, so let me ask you about this. These challenges. You're you're a professional red teamer, a professional pen tester. And that's, we know that's a goal of so many in this industry. Um, so do you view these challenges as something worth doing if you want to become a pen tester? Um, so I'm going to say yes, um, but not for the reason that you might suspect. I think that to be successful in this industry as a red team or as a pen tester or as insert your flavor, um, you kind of need to be a hobbyist, right? Like I really enjoy these kinds of problems, these kinds of puzzles. And this year for this badge challenge, I would say that of, you know, the 20 some odd challenges, maybe two of them had anything to do with what I do at work. Um, the, it was just a, a, a total miss in overlap of skill set. Um, these were, they, they were riddles. Um, and, you know, when I'm doing actual red team work, I'm not solving riddles, but I am, you know, solving challenges, except instead of, you know, figuring out whatever the answer to this riddle is, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do I get CrowdStrike Falcon to not detect my injection into whatever. Um, so it's it's the same mindset. It's that same, I love these little challenges. I love little puzzles. I love to, you know, have a problem and work at it until I get through it. Um, and that mindset, I think, is what makes you successful in the red teaming and pen testing industry. You know, that's really interesting because I come from originally a red team background, but then I moved into blue. And I feel like so much of what we do is um, it's essentially generating that guess, that hypothesis, and then testing yes. it, um, especially for threat hunting, for red teaming, same thing. You're, you're guessing what defenses are deployed, what detections, what rules, what heuristics. 
and you're trying to say, well, what if I tweak it this way? Maybe will that bypass, et cetera. Um, and, and ultimately, I, I agree with you completely. I think even challenges like this that don't really tie in to blue teaming, uh, you know, finding little Bobby tables for the Bob challenge isn't, <laughs> isn't necessarily going to make you a great detection engineer, but it is that kind of analytic thought that makes you Sorry. capable of finding mm -hmm. little Bobby tables that makes you an effective detection engineer. So I couldn't agree more. So let me, uh, let me pivot a little bit from this. So um, in your mind, what is it that takes someone from a uh, competition hacker? Um, and what I mean is, um, you know, the US cyber games, the global cyber games, um, the, the DEF CON hacking challenge, these types of CTFs and challenges. How does one transition from being the, you said hobbyist a minute ago, and uh, I, I recognize fully having competed uh, with uh, mixed results in some of those different competitions myself, that uh, hobbyist might not be the best term for someone who's competing in that. But what is it that takes it, that is the difference between a, a challenge competitor, let's say, and a professional red teamer and hacker? What sorts of things do you see as the big differences there? Hmm. So when we're talking about professional red teamer, um, I think it's it's more just uh, in the in the why in the uh, what what is the point of what you do, you know uh, your your typical hacker your typical CTF you know I I would equate that to you know kind of your typical pen tester in the professional world where you know they they want to hack all the things and that's great that's a, a good skill set it's it's something that you know big businesses need. You know, anyone with a web facing anything is going to want to get a pen tester to look at it and make sure that they can't find any vulnerabilities. But that's not really what a red team provides. Uh, uh, as a red teamer, um, I'm looking to sort of uh, create teachable moments, right? Um, my job is to is to test uh, the detection response capability of an organization. Um, I understand what a script kitty looks like uh, when when someone who doesn't really know what they're doing goes and downloads Metasploit and throws it at somebody uh, or, you know, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, I understand what an APT looks like. I understand, you know, uh, advanced tools, advanced uh, techniques, persistence, threat evasion, uh, covert C2 channels. Um, and what I do is I try to take that knowledge and then display it to an organization's blue team or whoever in a way that both tests whatever software, whatever playbooks, techniques they have, um, and hopefully pushes them to, okay, I can do this well, I can see this kind of technique well, and maybe this other kind of thing I, I can't see well, or I'm not trained to, or I don't know how to respond to well. Um, I'm trying to take what they're capable of doing and A, make sure that they can do it, and B, maybe push them a little bit beyond what they're trained to handle, right? Um, and being able to sort of game the system to where my attacks are either easier or harder, depending on the target. That's that's the skill of a red team, I think. So what you're saying is that red team largely exists to support blue team. That's what I'm hearing is red team should be, the, you heard it here from Pete, red team should be properly titled blue team support. That That's the, that's, repeating your words just in another way right thanks i hate it <laughs> um it's that's a running joke uh in, in our company so uh bear with me I, i've been trying to nail pete down on that for a very long time so i'm glad you guys were here for that um the but the reality is i couldn't agree more with you that um and i think the the uh more honest way to say it is that the red team that is there to challenge the skill set of the blue team, right? right? And if you can't present them threats in different, uh, in terms of different complexities, like you said, starting from you know script kitty or obvious denial of service attacks all the way up to an APT, then are you really effectively challenging them? And then even going, uh, I'm gonna say kind of laterally across the attack chill ch kill chain using different techniques, like you said, covert channels, um, you know, um, encrypting uh, different types of you know data in different ways um, those those different um, you know kind of multi-dimensional challenges I think 
I couldn't agree with more with you, are absolutely critical to growing the skill set of a blue team. So let me let me ask you this. What sorts of things make, um, you know, what is it that makes a red team or a really professional one? And I know uh, I'm kind of leading you into the demonstration that we have set up. But, um, you know, what sorts of things do you do as you're laying down an attack? And I know we're going to jump over and, you know, show um, in platform right now what that looks like. Um, but, you know, as I as I kind of bring this up and share it out to those who are who are along for the, the ride, you know, what is it that um, that that makes a good live fire exercise or a um, um, excuse me, a, you know, like a good experience like that for them. Sure. Um, so I'm trying not to sound like an echo chamber here, but again, it's going to, it's going to really depend on the customer, uh, on the target audience here, or the, the target specifically, right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, if, if we're going up against somebody who's, who's, you know, smaller companies, people who are newer at this, people without, you know, million dollar budgets for defense, um, then I think that a good red team engagement is going to highlight for them perhaps why they might need to invest in that kind of thing. Um, we, I mean, you have to understand both sides of the equation. You have to understand what a blue team should be looking at um, to understand kind of their gaps and then poke at those gaps, right, uh, to, to highlight them. But then on the other end of the spectrum, if you're going up against a big, big name, big business, big money, um, then you're going to want to make sure that whatever you're doing is going to be pushing them um, and that can be really challenging like that's where that's where the overwhelming majority of the effort of the red team comes because uh, uh we're going up against big security tools you know crowdstrike falcon being probably the number one thorn in my side um <laughs> we need to make sure that we can operate in such a way that crowdstrike doesn't just immediately flag what we're doing and be like oh hey they're here go ahead and kick them out um and and that that can you be think that would be you think that would be suboptimal in terms of challenging the blue oh, team? Oh, absolutely. You know, if they, if they just wait for the light to turn red and then, you know, push the button, what have, what have we taught them? Um, so let's take a look right now. Um, I have brought up the network impact map from the range. So talk me through mm -hmm. the sorts of things that we're about to see go down in this. So tell me a little bit about this scenario. Sure. Um, so for this quick little demo, uh, what I'm going to do is hopefully um, use a recent Microsoft Office exploit that came out. Uh, called Felina. Uh, fans of the industry will, will recognize this one immediately. So basically, um, Felina is the name given to a uh, remote code execution flaw in something called the uh, MSDT, the Microsoft Support Diagnostics Tool. Um, uh, to oversimplify a very complicated thing, basically, um, Office documents uh, have templates built into them. These templates are able to automatically download content um, and there was a buffer overflow in that automatic download capability where if you constructed a, a blob to throw at it in the right way, it would overflow a buffer and you could uh, execute PowerShell code uh, without causing any pop-ups to the user, which is great. Um, so well, what I did basically- Maybe not so great for that user. <laughs> it's great for me. Uh, uh, <laughs> the red teamer, I think that's fantastic. For the for the rest of the civilized world, that's, that's awful. Um, but yeah, difference in perspective there, I guess. Important to, important to point out. Um, so what I've done here is uh, I've weaponized a Office document uh, with the Felina exploit built into it to uh, execute a, a, a ransomware that, that uh, uh, my colleague has written in PowerShell. And I've just modified it to uh, work with this document and, and then do some fancy like encrypting, exfiltrating and, and changing of the desktop background in a threatening way. Um, so um, if you want, Pete, you can actually, is there a way for me to pump my screen out for a second while I run through this? Sure, that sure. For everybody? Uh, let me hit the share screen button. Or do you have to end sharing your screen before? No, I no you're good. It? You're good. Go ahead. Yeah, when I hit the share screen button, I'm not getting anything. So I don't think that's working. I'll give it back to you. Don't worry about it. All right, here we go. Now I can hit the button. And here's my screens. OK. So let me talk you through what we're looking at real quick here. Um, you're going to see two windows. The window on the left is my attacker box, my Kali box. Uh, the window on the right is my victim. This is just a you know, Windows 10 
somebody, in this case, uh, what's my victim's name? Brock from accounting. So poor Brock from accounting is going to have a bad day here. Um, this window on the top left, uh, talking about my Kali box here, this window on the top left is going to be my main attacker uh, terminal window. Um, you see I have a, uh, a few virtual interfaces set up. I'm just, I'm going to make it look like it's three or four different machines attacking him or involved in this attack chain. Um, physically, it's one machine, but as far as the network traffic and on your network map, it's going to look like multiple machines. So just uh, gloss over that. Um, but I'm going to send him an email, spear phishing email. I'm going to tell him, you know, he works in accounting. Maybe I found these emails just doing some some trolling around the internet. Um, I'm I'm spoofing myself to look like one of his colleagues in accounting and saying, oh hey, I've got uh, I've got these new pay pay tables that we're going to be getting soon, uh, because people love to look at things uh, involving their own pay. And then I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to act like Brock and I'm going to be an idiot and click on the thing. Um, Excellent. All right. So while you're doing that, I'm going to take over the share for just a second and sure. show that what we've done is, and this is this is one of my personal opinions, that one of the big elements that makes a really professional red team is the quality of the documentation that goes into uh, the engagement. And so from here, you can see what we call thread impact map and it's showing that you, Pete, you keep going while I'm doing this. I'm just filibustering for you right now. Is uh, is that you, the Cali 15 box up here, are going ahead and act and sending a spear phishing email to the INET email machine, and that's been downloaded by ACC Win 10 4, um, our our poor hapless user who's going to uh, make questionable life choices in just a moment here. So I'm going to turn yep. it back over to you now, and yep. we'll go ahead and see what happens when uh, when our buddy uh, goes ahead and clicks. Okay. So as you can see here, that email that I just sent is now in, in uh, Brock's inbox. So two other windows that I'd like you to keep an eye on here. This bottom left window um, is going to be my web server where I'm hosting not only the stage two of the Felina malware, but I'm also hosting the stage three uh, PowerShell uh, script that's going to be executed to cause the ransomware to kick off. And this bottom right window is my listening post out on the internet to receive all those files that I'm going to steal from my victim. So again, going back over to my victim, I'm just having a good day. I see this email about new pay tape, new pay scales. Oh my goodness! Let's uh, go ahead and open that up. And uh, without any further user interaction, we should see a whole lot of get requests on the bottom left there. That's getting the stage one. There's the stage two get. On the right here, Brock's just looking at a compatibility troubleshooter, wondering what's going on there. But don't worry about that. You can see now that my exfil has started. I've stolen pretty much all the files in his, uh, everything that's a, what is it, docx, a, a Excel spreadsheet, PDFs. I just scanned the system and grabbed anything that was interesting automatically. So at this point, we're gonna say that maybe Brock is just kind of done looking at this screen. So he's gonna close all this stuff. And we'll notice that, oh boy, all your files have been encrypted. And if you wanna get them back, you gotta send a Bitcoin to an address. Um, if you go into his documents down here, let's see. You'll see that all of his stuff now has a dot crypto extension and is totally inaccessible. And it's all sitting here on my attack box. So that was it. That was the whole attack. It, it's a lot more complicated than it may seem, but all he had to do was open an office document. A whole lot of magic happened in the background. And, and now hopefully I'm going to get some Bitcoin. We'll see. So if we take a look as you populated each one of those steps, you can actually see, and I'm going to take over your screen share. That is uh, that is the um, that red desktop of both success and failure. Success for you and failure for Brock. Um, and of course, this now leaves, think about what this means from the blue team perspective. They now have a large amount of activity that's been logged that they can detect. Now, a number of indicators mm -hmm. of compromise, starting with the host artifacts on Brock's machine, uh, we've got the email artifacts and, you know, application logs in the, the mail servers. We've got network traffic between all of the different IP addresses associated because you talked about a three stage impact plant, right? So the initial file transfer, that's one artifact. Uh, then you've got the network connection out to the second stage implant. And of course, the download of the second stage um, and then the download of the third stage, which is that PowerShell. So those would be all artifacts that a, a blue team should be looking to capture as they do that initial scoping of that, uh, you know, kind of the triage of that incident. So uh, what I'm going to do is kick it back over because I think one of the things I really like about the way you capture this information here is 
this gives us an excellent understanding of all the various artifacts that are in place like here are the connections here are the different entities it reaches out to you know this machine in our gray space it reaches out to another machine in the gray space it downloads and executes though that's the movement of those artifacts and the behaviors across the network and of course the host logs as well um you can't it's a little bit harder to see on the impact map and i don't really feel like digging into the logs to show exactly what happens but talk to me about why it is you document these things this way as part of this um, blue team support role uh, that you have as a professional red team. Well, I need to calm down after that last statement. <clears throat> um, <laughs> no. So I, again, I, I did say it. I got to stick by my words here. We are here to improve what the blue team does. So you have to catch <laughs> these things because when you're the blue team, right, when you're defending a network and somebody, you know, gives you an angry phone call and says, oh my goodness, you know, I've got this ransomware note on my desktop and all my stuff's encrypted. Um, this is what they should have seen uh, to, to tell them what happened, right? Hopefully somewhere along the kill chain of things that I just laid down, uh, there was some detection or prevention logic that would have stopped the attack from being successful. In the range here, it was successful. Um, in real life, it, it's going to depend entirely, again, on, on your people, your budget, and all that good stuff. But, you know, it's like, I was talking about a buddy with a buddy the other day about, you know, when, when you, when you take a test, for example, right. And you get a couple of questions wrong. The worst thing in the world is when you get that test back and they didn't explain to you why it was wrong. They just say wrong, right. The learning happens when you get that explanation, the backstory, why was it wrong? Why was it right? Uh, in this case, all of that stuff that you've graphed out there is is the why. It's it's how it happened. It's where your indicators are. It's where you can look to see it again, or uh, you know things like it, um, be it the host based artifacts or the network artifacts or or what have you. I think that's an excellent point, and you know. Um you you i think you hit on a really important concept there that there's gradients of success for the blue team um you know there's one stage of success where they have successfully deployed protections that stop that spear phishing email in its tracks mm -hmm. um they've successfully patched that virtual machine so that felina vulnerability no longer exists um and you know these are all things that basically are what i call profanity inducing events for the red <laughs> team right but, um, uh, and I, I suppose you could probably put together a scale, like how much profanity did we induce in the red team as a blue team? Were we successful? Yes, uh, they sound unhappy. Um, yeah. But, you know, and then the, and then, okay, yes, the exploit landed. And then how much were we able to detect, right? So did we stop them? That's one, that's one measure of success. And then what do we know about what did go down in our environment? And so just as you see here, each of these lines exists as information that can be collected. And really only if you detect all of these indicators and make a reasonable conclusion and take the correct, corrective actions and from there start talking about implementing further detections or controls to prevent this sort of behavior in the future, only then would we say, man, this blue team is really on top of their a game this was this was right. tremendous work and um and so i think that's essentially this documentation that the red team is providing allows for that last mile in what i would call a professional red team engagement or pen test, pen test engagement which is the report that says what did you do how did you do it what areas of improvement you know what are, what were the metrics for assessment um and in some ways those are the most important least fun things to do and just like with all documentation from from commenting your code to uh to creating you know effective user guides um oftentimes documentation is the the least splashy thing you do um and yet can have critical importance to you know what your end customer experience is absolutely well that is about all the time we have today um pete i can't tell you how much i appreciate you coming to join me um, as Maybe. always, it's a pleasure hanging out um, with the other Pete. Um, and it doesn't matter who that is this time, um, but only this time. So uh, let's take a quick look and see if we've got any uh, burning questions from our audience. It doesn't look like we do at the moment. Pete, any last things you want to say before we take off for the day? Uh, no. Again, happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the chat.
Um, if anyone has any questions about anything that they just saw or uh, want to talk about the Black Badge more, um, I'm happy to do so. You can find me on LinkedIn uh, or just reach out in the chat now. Uh, otherwise, thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. Well, it was a pleasure, Pete, and uh, can't wait until next time. Take care. That sounds good. All right.